just want to take a minute and introduce our panelists. So first of all, we've got Tony Morgan here with us today. Tony, of course, is the founder and lead strategist here at the Unstuck Group. Uh, he started the Unstuck Group back in 2009, and uh, we've served almost 600 churches throughout the United States and in several other countries around the world. So, Tony, good to have you here today. Yeah, Sean, it's good to be with you today. And I love being able to talk about this because restructures can be so challenging and so rewarding in the same breath. And um, I, I mentioned on the podcast, I've been through a couple of restructures in my previous life as a city manager. But at the Unstuck Group, we've been through staff restructures with the churches I've served, we have as well. And what I do know is that uh, if you don't restructure, that has an impact on the team. And uh, largely that has to do with a lack of clarity around roles and decision making and the ability to move our strategy forward. And all of that obviously impacts our mission as a church. And so if we don't restructure, that's a huge issue. Um, but if we do restructure, I know that the people that are really looking forward to getting clarity about their roles and moving the mission forward, they're excited about it. But because it involves people, uh, there are those that, even if it's a healthy restructure, are going to be concerned about that. And so I think it's just a it's a good reminder of why this topic specifically is so important, because I know for many pastors, we didn't sign up for this when we got into ministry. Uh, and so I'm glad uh, that we'll have an opportunity today to help you think about some specific steps that you need to engage uh, if you're in a position where you need to restructure your team as well. Absolutely. And of course, we have our friend and teammate, Amy Anderson, here with us today. Amy serves as the Director of Consulting here at the Unstuck Group since about 2016. And during that time, she has helped over 150 churches design their ministry strategy, address staffing and structure issues uh, with their multi-site strategies, and just kind of align all of that and fuel their mission. So Amy, good to have you here with us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. And Tony, I agree with you. You know, when I was on staff at Eagle Brook for 13 years, the first restructure was fine because all for me, I just got promoted <laughs> and I moved on <laughs> to the team. Um, but I had relationships with some people who were no longer on the team and that was hard. And then fast forward, you know, five or six, seven years, every time we restructured, Tony, it's because our leadership team got too big. You know, we just yeah. kept adding people, especially through multi-site. We'd add campus pastors and new roles that emerged. But then it became time, you know, I think we got to nine or 10. We had to downsize again. And that time I was on the decision-making team. And that always makes it harder. I'm a relational person. And mm -hmm. when you're on a team with someone, relationships get formed. And then, I don't know, changes, new rhythms. But it was necessary. We never would have grown. We never would have launched new campuses. We never would have really reached and discipled the people we did had we not made those changes. And um, hearing those numbers of churches that we've worked with, I've, I looked at my calendar and I have worked with 19 churches this year alone, um, mm -hmm. working on their staffing and structure plans. And that's, you know, multi-site churches, single site churches, and all of them had a couple things in common. Number one, the senior pastor was just doing so much more than he or she should be, meaning just had their hands in so many things. They were all overstaffed um, and they just didn't have clear ministry lanes anymore. So it kind of been piecemeal together. And so it's hard. They're, they're praying through their plans, but the good news is they have a plan and now they're working towards that new future. And because I've been to the new future, going through my own restructures, I can just say it's a new day once you get here. So I'm so glad everyone who's joining us on this webinar. We've just been praying that there's a nugget or two in here today that helps you take the next steps that you need to take. Yeah, absolutely. And and here's specifically why we chose this topic you know, and why it's the right one for the conversation today. Um, what we've seen is on this side of the pandemic, most churches have staffing challenges. Uh, many churches today are overstaffed. Churches are seeing that their organizational structure, it doesn't align with their new kind of post-pandemic ministry strategies. Uh, we've experienced the great resignation and churches have some serious gaps in leadership. It, your, your structure as a church is perfectly designed to get the results that you're seeing today. So if you don't like the results you're seeing, it might be time for a change. You know, Sean, as you're sharing that um, for for this past year, okay, for those 19 uh, 19 churches I worked with, there were some patterns in what they said. You know, some of the pastors were like, 
I'm just, I'm pretty sure we're overstaffed, but I don't know where we're overstaffed. In some areas, we actually might be understaffed. Um, others would say we've got this great team, but I'm not really sure we're spending, you know, our time on the right thing. Um, less people are engaged in the church right now, so people, the staff, are really finding things to do. But are they the right things? Um, and Tony, what you said, you know, they just, one one pastor got really honest. Just I'm not sure. I can do this on the people side of things without a little bit right. of help. So, right. Yeah. And just to confirm a couple of things that you've mentioned, both of you, I mean, churches are overstaffed right now. At this point in the pandemic, churches haven't returned to pre pandemic levels, uh, even though their giving has remained strong. And that's allowed churches to maintain staffing levels. But for the first time, I would say in the last six months or so, we're starting to see that now giving is not tracking where it has the last couple of years. And I think that's shining the light on the overstaffing issue at this point. Uh, a lot of churches, too, are just living with structures that have evolved over time. Um, but now they're at a place where they're recognizing we need to embrace new strategies at this point. Um, and their structure doesn't match that. And then I think, Sean, you mentioned the great resignation, and it's just leaving churches with a lot of open positions right now. And many of these churches, I think rightly so, are pausing to ask the question, is it right for us just to refill that role? Or do we need to revisit our structure, particularly because we're starting to feel some of these financial constraints? And maybe that might involve reducing staffing, but at the same time, looking for opportunities to invest in some new key roles that we need to move our mission forward. Absolutely. So for those of you tuning in today, we, we kind of have an agenda. We have a decision that we want you to make. We want you to commit today, uh, really, I mean, put it on your calendar to start the process of restructuring your church, your church staff for the health and effectiveness of your ministry. It is too important to the health of your church to delay much longer. So specifically today, we're going to talk through a few things and how to approach it in three sequential steps. First of all, how to assess your current team health and performance. Secondly, how to evaluate leadership capacity and potential of those on your team. And then lastly, how to structure to your strategy. So let's get into the content. Step one, we're assessing, we're talking about how to assess current team health and performance. And if you're going to effectively restructure your church, you've got to start here. If you skip assessment, you're going to make mistakes in the restructuring and all the restructuring mistakes necessarily have consequences that, that, that hurt people. So Tony, what are some of the reasons that it's so critical to assess current team health and performance before you begin this process? Yeah, well, I think these three critical questions jumped to mind, Sean, when you asked that question. And the first is, does our structure support our ministry strategy? Um, because one of the things I've noticed uh, through the years is healthy churches change their structure when they change their strategy. Amy and I talked about this in the podcast recently, uh, but uh, healthy churches are thinking strategy than structure, than people. And it's interesting, uh, unfortunately, stuck churches look at that in the reverse. They look at who, who do we have on our team, then how do we structure those people, and then what's the strategy that we can engage. Uh, but healthy churches recognize if our vision and strategy changes, the structure must change. Otherwise, our legacy structure will always revert back to our previous vision and strategy. It's, it's like we hired people to do some things, and if we don't change the structure, they're gonna continue to do those things that they've done in the past. Um, the second key question is, does our structure provide a healthy span of care? And Amy alluded to this a moment ago. It's not unusual over time as the church, especially as a growing church, as the church grows, they add more staff, and we just add, to the span of care or the span of control, depending on your perspective, of, of the leaders on our team, and especially for the senior leadership team. That team can continue to grow and grow and grow, and at some point, it just it's not healthy anymore. And so we just need to make sure the span of care is healthy. And then the maybe the third question to ask to help us assess uh, our structure 
is does our structure leverage the strengths and the leadership capacity of the right people in the right roles? And Sean, I know we're going to talk more about leadership capacity in a moment. But I'm actually thinking Amy might be a better better person um, to talk through the that understanding of employee strengths before you restructure so that we make sure the team actually reflects all of the giftedness of the body of Christ. So I don't know, Amy, can you help us with that a little bit? Yeah, Tony, one of my favorite assessment tools is a disc-based assessment called Leading from Your Strengths. And if you're a regular listener of the Unstuck Church podcast, You've probably heard me talk about this before, but here's what I love about it. First, it reminds everybody of their natural approaches to things like problem solving, how they process information, how they manage change and face risk. Because intellectually, we know that we're all wired differently, but in reality, we often expect everyone to be just like us. So understanding the team's natural strengths helps the teams work better together and also lean on one another when a particular strength is needed. So the second thing I love about it is that it's a visual tool to see how the whole team is wired. It gives you perspectives if you have a diversity, like you said, of strengths on the team or if you're all wired similarly. And church teams that lack diversity honestly are often stuck and churches that have a diverse mix of gifts have a better opportunity to be healthy. So do you mind if I just show you a couple of examples of teams I've worked with? It'd be great, yeah. Okay, so this is the wheel. And of course, up here, if you plot on the upper half of the wheel, you are more focused on getting the task and the mission accomplished. If you're on the bottom part of this wheel, you really tip more towards people and relationships. And if you cut it in half, this kind of represents the faster paced people, and this is more of the slower pace, or I take a step back before I take a step forward. Um, and so we break these into the quadrants, and this is where the disc kind of comes in. This is the D, the I, the S, the C. We use different names. We call them a driver. Tony, I think this is where you plot. Sean, I think this yeah. is where you plot. I'm down here in the sunny yellow part, right? Um, <laughs> and we call that the expressive. Over here, we call it the amiable, and up here, the analytic. And so we put teams through these assessments to uh, help them see where the whole team plots. So let me just show you a few um, that I pulled out from recently. So this is not uncommon to have a team that's primarily on the bottom part of the wheel because a lot of us who go into ministry, we love people, not saying Tony and Sean, you don't, but we love people <laughs> and you know that's just our natural bent. So it's not unusual to have the upper part of this wheel a little lighter or empty in this case and where it is. The most frequent thing we see, of course, is that we're missing a driver on the team. Someone who's focused on getting things done and works at a fast pace. Um, let me show you another one here. So this one's similar. We, we have a little bit more on the upper half, a couple of additional people. And these churches, you, as you can imagine, they struggle to get things done. They get along really well. They've got a lot of relational capital, but we're missing that action. Here's a couple of the healthy churches we worked with. Okay, you see you've got a little bit more disbursement over all of those gifts, and I'll just show you one more for fun. It's not unusual sometimes at, because of who we have in the room. There are typically analytics on the team, especially in the operational areas. They just aren't always in the meeting that I'm leading. So we look at it with the 12 people, 8 to 12 people we're leading through, but this is a really good assessment for any leadership team to take a look at. The la lastly, what I like about this assessment is it shows how people adapt. So in this case here, this is where the team was dispersed and those lines show how the team is adapting. And I can guarantee you this person here is the lead pastor. And because he or she didn't have a driver on the team, they're moving up there to cover it. You can see this analytic also picking up pace to cover that work that's not being done. I don't know why this guy went all the way up here to analytic. There's probably a reason for it. But, but what's important about this is that you want people working in their natural strengths. You don't want them jumping you know, across various uh, lines. You want a person with a natural wiring to do that. Because I often use the example, when you switch quadrants, it's like taking the pen you know, when you write with your dominant hand, just put it in the other hand for a while and see yeah. how hard that is because you end up, you know, you can do it, but the quality is often less than if you had it in your dominant hand. Feels weird, takes more time. I have to think more, 
versus if you had someone in that natural space. Mm. So that's one of my favorite tools. That's yeah, really and good. And Amy, Sean and I, we, f we assume that you love the mission as well, even though you're on the bottom <laughs> of the chart. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I do. <laughs> So, Tony, just, besides just looking at some of the natural strengths, what are some other ways that churches can really just assess team health and performance? Yeah, well, I think one of the keys here is to look at just the diversity overall of the team. And Amy spoke to the diversity of gifts and strengths, which is critical. And as she acknowledged, it's just not unusual for church teams, unfortunately, to be lacking that kind of diversity. And so that's one of the key reasons why we really need to assess the strengths of the team to make sure that we are a true reflection of the body of Christ. But there are other areas to be considering related to diversity on our team as well. Just kind of backgrounds and experiences. I mean, people, we want people bringing a variety of those experiences to the team. Uh, uh, generational uh, diversity is also a common challenge now that we're seeing in churches where over time, the churches have matured and the church staff teams have matured, especially as it relates to staff leadership. And this is an area where we need just to be more intentional about raising up, especially those millennial and Gen Z people on our team to take on new leadership capacity. And then maybe the more obvious places where we need diversity around genders and ethnicities, especially because we want our team to reflect the mission field that we're trying to reach. We wanna reach people, uh, help them meet and follow Jesus. And the more our team reflects the diversity of that mission field, the easier it is going to be for us to do that. Uh, but this is one of those areas where we do have to figure out as we look at the diversity of our team to just our, our natural inclination as a, as a team, um, because there's usually a leaning more towards health, pursuing health as a team, or we tend to lean more towards the performance. And some of that has to do with what uh, Amy just showed if our team tends to be more people oriented, I think we tend to think first about team health and sometimes our performance, kind of that commitment to the mission can be missing. And we've seen some teams that have a lot of task oriented kind of mission focused people mm -hmm. and it's high performing. They're getting a lot done, especially if there are a lot of drivers on the team. But where the team might be lacking is around some of those health issues. And as you can imagine, over time, that can really create distrust on the team. It can create kind of a toxic culture among the team. And that's why we really have to pay attention as we're doing this assessment. Are we both healthy as a team and is our team high performing? That's good, Tony. And, and for those of you who are tuned in today live to today's live webinar, we'd like to give you free access to our Unstuck Teams assessment. The Unstuck Teams assessment helps you assess team health. So right now in Zoom, use the Q&A feature, not, not the chat feature on the side. At the bottom, click the button that says Q&A. Um, and let Tiffany from our team know that you'd like access. And we'll email you a link in the next few days. So here's what we need from you. Click, click Q&A. And we need you to enter your email address, your church's name, and your city and state. Your email address, church's name, and city and state right now in the Q&A future. And Sean, let me just add the great thing about that assessment, uh, the Unstuck Teams assessment, which we want to offer you, is it both looks at um, health and performance. And it's getting that feedback that we need from our team to assess both because Many teams tend to lean one direction or, other, or the other. And mm -hmm. so that unstuck teams assessment helps us identify where do we have gaps. Okay, let's move on to step two, evaluating the leadership capacity and potential that you currently have on your team. Tony, why is this our recommended next step? Well, uh, partly because what we've seen through the years is healthy churches right-size their staff team. And what this means is we're getting the right-size staff 
with that right mix that we just talked about of strengths and other aspects of, of what we're trying to see in a healthy team. Uh, we get the right size team um, so that we can accomplish the mission that God's called us to based on really the size of our churches. And what we see is that healthy churches shoot for one full-time equivalent staff person for every 75 to 80 people in attendance. And by the way, because we, when we talk about full-time equivalents, um, especially in church context, let me clarify a few things related to that. First of all, that includes the entire staff, not just the ministerial staff. And so that would include support uh, roles, that would include facilities uh, positions as an example. Um, and then when we compare it to attendance, that also, uh, we're looking at total average attendance for adults, for all the students, and for all the kids. So it's not just comparing to adult attendance, it's the total attendance, including students and kids. And healthy churches are able to have staffing ratios uh, like this because they're hiring leaders rather than doers. In other words, they hire staff leaders who know how to identify and empower volunteer leaders and build volunteer teams. Uh, a second thing that we see uh, with healthy churches when they look at their leadership capacity is that they're hiring fewer staff, which allows them to pay the staff that they have better. And this is where hopefully every staff person um, that's watching this is celebrating is, yeah, I, I, want, I, want to be, I want to be a part of that team. Uh, but related to this then, and this is what's so critical right now, where so many churches are seeing a lot of resignations, a lot of people moving on to other opportunities. When you hire fewer staff and pay them well, it helps you retain those high capacity staff, which is important. It's an important consideration, especially in our current economy. And then uh, related to this, healthy churches elevate high capacity leaders. They recognize that all leaders are not created equal. There are different levels of leadership capacity. And just because someone can lead a team, as an example, doesn't necessarily mean that they can lead an entire ministry department or an entire campus of the church. Um, and this is a critical. This is critical, really, to getting uh, the structure right. And honestly, this is why growing churches sometimes have to restructure because sometimes the leadership capacity required for certain roles changes as the church experiences growth. And so it's not that the leader has changed, it's just that the mission and the church have changed as growth has happened. And sometimes the leadership capacity required for certain leadership roles has begun to exceed the leadership wiring of the person that has been in that role for some time. Amy, what are some tools that you've found to help churches assess leadership capacity and potential? Yeah, well, one of them relates to what Tony just shared. We really take it out of Exodus and we look at, are our people leaders of themselves? Are they leaders of tens? Are they leaders of fifties, hundreds, or thousands? So I think it goes back to, if I can say the GLS days when everyone was cast vision that they're a leader. And there, it's true, we all have leadership in us, but there are lids. And so we really take an honest assessment of just what level are they working at today and what's their potential. But one of the key conversations I think that helps church leaders is what we call the leadership assessment ledger. And we use this assessment tool um, to have the leaders reflect on their team members and evaluate their character, their chemistry, their competence, and their fit with the culture. And what I like about it is that it's a diagnostic approach to understanding where team members are thriving and where they need coaching and growth. So I'm just going to show you a simple form that we use when we're on site with the church. And it's simple math, Tony, so mm -hmm. I can do it. So we take this ledger and we just put our team members' names here and we fill in the boxes, right? Character, chemistry, competence. So, and we do a scoring of zero to 10 on this. So obviously zero to three is lower, four to seven, somewhere in the middle, eight to nine is a really high score. Um, and by the way, this was meant to be like a personal evaluation of yourself. Like all of us as leaders, 
we can't afford to be weak in any of these areas. You know, play to your strengths, manage to your weakness. You can't say, well, I'm going to be really good at competence, but that chemistry thing, you know, that's a weakness for me. So I'm just going to ignore it. Any leader has to be high in all of these areas. And if you're mm -hmm. significantly low in any of them, whether you have the capacity to lead hundreds, if you're low in character or low in any of these, really, it's, you're not qualified. So we just have an honest conversation. And of course, you know, character, that's foundational to everything else. It's morals, ethics, attitudes, behaviors. Um, we ask, is this leader honest and trustworthy? Is he or she a positive example to others? Are they patient, disciplined, those types of things? And I can't multitask, so let me just take my picture down here <laughs> That's really okay. quick. Well, Amy, as you were reviewing that too, what occurred to me is I've watched you facilitate this conversation many times and others on our team too. And really the advantage of bringing somebody in from the outside, especially for this conversation, is you ask the right questions for the senior mm -hmm. pastor and the executive pastor to really do an honest assessment of their team. It's kind of mm -hmm. removing for a moment from the relationships and some of the emotions attached to that conversation. Uh, having that outside facilitator, mm -hmm. especially for this conversation, is just so critical. And just in case we have people on the webinar who, you know, Let's not bring them in to do that. <laughs> Let me tell you the heart, the heart behind it, why I love this exercise is because we finally name what it is we want to see growth in in somebody. That's right. We get really specific and it all goes back to the motivation. We don't do this exercise so that we can be punitive. We do this exercise because we were motivated as managers and coaches to help people understand their blind spots and help them actually improve. So you guys know what these are, but chemistry, you know, that's emotional intelligence, the ability to read a room, right? Do you understand, do they understand the impact of their words and behaviors? That was some of the feedback I got in my late twenties. Like, do you know what it's like when you enter a room? I had no idea. It was a complete blind spot for me. And of course, competence is the ability to get your job done. You know, self-motivation, diligence. I like uh, Patrick Lincioni would use the word hunger in this area because are we eager to grow? Are we open to new ideas? And obviously, do we get the results that the job is there for? So all of those three, I my colleague actually coined the phrase, but I call it personal wisdom. These are the things that we need to be, you know, Sean, you need to know you. I need to know me. Tony, you need to know you. How are we doing in these areas? And then the last area is around culture. And I call that organizational wisdom. Because organizational wisdom is, do I behave with as the culture has what we've defined for our culture? We call them culture shaping behaviors. But sometimes you've got a really high performer um, and high chemistry and high character, but they really don't represent your church, you know, the, the culture of your staff, if I could put it this way. And so I go back to the motivation. If someone's a five on chemistry and a nine on competence, you know, that coaching is very different than someone who's an, um, how did I say, someone who's like a nine on chemistry and a five on competence. So again, diagnostic helps you, helps you evaluate. So leadership that way and leadership with their actual capacity, those two interacting conversations really help you refine who needs to be on that leadership team. That's good. Amy, as, as you were talking about that, I was just reminded about my early days in leadership. I mean, it was <laughs> my first leadership position and my boss kind of went through a similar exercise and really affirmed, I mean, the character piece that he saw in me um, and the competence piece, which was encouraging, but it was around the chemistry piece. And he <laughs> said, he said, uh, Tony, you just have this tendency to be a little bit curt with people. And I, first of all, I had to go look up what the word means. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, basically, he was saying you, you're a little bit abrupt. You're, you're just a little bit you, you don't you don't take the time to acknowledge the person and to navigate relationally what you're trying to accomplish, which Amy knows this because she's worked with me now for a number of years. But early <laughs> on, I needed to hear that feedback. I needed to receive that yeah. coaching to become a better leader. And that's the brilliance of this exercise. Mm -hmm. Kurt. There like you that. go. <laughs> look, look, look it up, Sean. <laughs> so for, for our viewers today, uh, every, everybody just take a second, grab a pen and paper, uh, use your computer, just something to write with. 
Um, and here's here's what we want you to do out of this. Jot down the first three names that come to mind of leaders that are currently at your church with the character, the chemistry, the competency, and the culture fit to lead at a higher level than you're currently asking to, them to lead. Just three names of those people at your church right now that have the character, chemistry, competency, and culture fit to lead it at a higher level than they're currently at. All right. So lastly, let's get into how we structure around our strategy and some best practices for actually designing that new structure that matches and supports our ministry strategy. So Tony, what does a ministry structure that supports ministry strategy actually look like? Yeah. So first of all, and I mentioned this earlier today, um, we need to think strategy then structure, then people. And this is where I've had churches, pastors contact me and say, we need a structure change. And they want us to jump straight to whatever the structure change is. And we can't do that. And the reason why is the church has never, or it's been a long time since they've thought about, okay, this is our mission. How are we going to accomplish that mission, which speaks to the strategies that we're going to use? And so we, when we help churches, we help them get clarity on that strategy first before we help them shape the structure to support the strategy. And then lastly, we help them identify the people that fit in the structure and, of course, what we see in stuck churches is they do. They approach that from the opposite direction, basically, where they look at their people and then they put them into a structure and then they figure out what's the strategy that we can engage. And again, that's part of the reason why commonly those churches may be stuck. Um, another uh, uh, example here that we look at is just uh, clarifying that healthy churches structure for both their reach strategy and their discipleship strategy. And if you think about it, there's this, this mission that we're on to help people move from where they are to where God wants them to be. And commonly, that, doesn't, that journey doesn't begin with them already following Jesus. There are some steps that people have to take to move from being not interested in faith to becoming spiritually curious to then actually becoming a new believer, a new follower of Christ. And so what we see is many churches structure solely for their discipleship strategy, assuming we're only looking at half of someone's spiritual journey. But healthy churches, on the other hand, structure for both their reach strategy and their discipleship strategy. Healthy churches also link every ministry to their senior leadership team. And because of that, there are no ministry silos within the church. Every ministry is connected and aligned to the rest of the rest of the team. And I mean, it's, it's interesting. We see different examples of this, is, uh, this happening at different churches. Um, but in some churches, the silo ministries may be around age groups. And so maybe seniors or students are kind of disconnected from the rest of the team. In other ministries, it's kind of like almost the parachurch ministries. So um, think about missions efforts outside the church or outreach efforts into the community. Sometimes we've seen in churches where those ministries kind of become disconnected from the rest of the team. Um, the examples look different, but one of our goals when we help churches with staffing and structure is to make sure every ministry is aligned to the mission, the vision, the strategy that we're trying to accomplish, and every ministry is somehow connected to the senior leadership team. And then lastly, I would just acknowledge when we're looking at structure, this is really hard to do on our own. Um, getting, getting this right is really worth the investment of bringing some outside help in. And, and this sounds crazy, but I've actually, I mean, we do this for a living. 
but I actually pay people to, from the outside <laughs> to come help our team with strategy. And then I've had people that I've paid to help look at structure and kind of people challenges or opportunities that I'm asking about as far as the unstuck group is concerned as well. Um, this is this is one of those areas that if we make this investment, though, uh, we're going to make sure that we are investing financially in our team in a way that is more sustainable for the future. And unfortunately, right now, without that outside help to make these tough decisions, what I see many churches doing in this season is investing way too much money on their staffing structure. And as a result of that, it's impacting their ministry investment and their missions investment and the things that are really going to have an impact in the people's lives that we're trying to reach and encourage to follow Jesus. Amy, could you share and or show some examples of church org charts that really illustrate some of the points about what an effective or ineffective ministry staffing strategy looks like? Well, you know, I love org charts, so I, know. I have a few I can share. <laughs> I'm just assuming that you dream in org charts, Amy. I dream true? in org charts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you dream in content outlines. <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right. So here's a sample of an org chart from a church I worked with. Um, let me just show you what I see immediately. So they've got a leadership team here, which is a good thing. Everyone's connected to it. But right away, you can see this is what you just mentioned, Tony. This executive pastor of ministry is over, assuming the weekend service is a front door, is a reach strategy, over the reach strategy, over family ministries, and guest experience. So right now, that's a little odd to me, because then the group's life pastor is up over here, which and the care is over here. So in some ways, they've combined some of the discipleship and some of the weekend, and then they've got discipleship split between two leaders. Um, let me show you another one. So this one here, can you see that? Okay. See yes. if I can make it bigger. Yeah. So here's an example. Well, maybe you should guess, Tony, what, ch what challenge do you see there? Well, my goodness, the span of care looks crazy, yes. uh, especially, yes. and the, especially since it's the senior pastor. So I can't imagine as a senior pastor with the responsibilities that we've talked about the roles that they can't delegate to anybody else right. with all of those responsibilities, also having to lead all of these individuals. That's right. This guy had way too many direct reports and you can just see the division of all the work. There's no one leader championing reach. There's no one leader championing discipleship. It's shared and it's too large. And by the way, this span of care um, can also just be dripped down to an exec pastor. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see he's all right now or she's all right now, but this person is now the person with way too many mm -hmm. direct reports as we go. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to where we began today. Span of care is really important as well as um, organizing those ministry lanes to get clarity around that. So I'll take that down. That even makes my head hurt. Looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, some other tools that I consider that I just didn't show. One of the things I will add, Tony, as you were just talking about our process is that you do get a full summary, a written summary. I write a lot of summaries, you know, that are, mm -hmm. that's catered to each church that we serve. Um, we also talk through things like when we launch a new structure, what goes into that? And, you know, including things like who needs to meet together now and what are the new meeting rhythms that we need to adapt to? And then we talk about the strategic alignment pyramid all the time. We really work on the top of that alignment pyramid, meaning once we've got clarity around where we're going, what success looks like, and what our core strategies are going to be. Now, how do we interpret that into every ministry area and every person so that everyone's aligned and moving forward, um, you know, working on the same plans? Yeah. And Amy, let me just add a couple of things related to what we're helping churches with specifically related to structure. Number one, I mean, we've worked, you mentioned just nine, what was it 19 churches in, in the last uh, number of months here on staffing and structure. We're the learning. Last 12 months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're learning with what other churches are doing and not doing related to their structure in this particular season. And some things are working and some things aren't. And so we're able to bring that perspective and include that in the work that we're doing with your team. But here's especially for growing churches. 
uh, what I have really valued, and I know pastors do as well, is it's not just a current structure that we're offering. It's it's kind of looking into the future a bit too. And so uh, pastors can walk away with a staffing plan for the future that helps to prioritize what are the roles that we need to add next when the financial resources are there to add that person. And so mm-hmm. kind of a looking f- future forward too, it's good. It's just good to have that future staffing plan in place. Well, all these steps in this conversation are, are incredibly helpful, but one of the primary drivers for today's conversation is overstaffing. And Tony mentioned it earlier, our staffing ratios are headed in the wrong direction generally in the church based on the data of what we see. So uh, here's a challenge for you right now. We'd love for you to just take a minute and do the calculation for your church, okay? The calculation of specifically your attendance to staff FTE ratio. So here's, here's how you do the math. Take your average attendance over the previous 12 months and divide that by the total staff FTEs at your church. So average attendance for the previous 12 months divided by total staff FTEs, full-time equivalencies. So you may have some staff that are full-time, some that are part-time. Those part-times will add up to a certain full-time equivalency. Take just a minute, do that calculation for your church, and get a bit of an assessment on where you're at in the sense of overstaffing. Any any final thoughts? Uh, You know, as I was listening to us uh, talk that through, just thinking about the people side, lots of conversation going on around that and around the leadership assessment ledger. So if you, if and when you restructure, just a reminder to put great managers in your leadership positions. You know, managers communicate what success looks like to their team members. They have regular one-on-ones to inspect priorities, develop people, and they notice when their team members are being successful and they step in when they're off track. And honestly, that's the heart behind those exercises we talk through. Everybody needs to know when they're doing well. Uh, I always say what gets noticed gets repeated. And it's so true. We need encouragement. And great managers do that so well. And they have these uncomfortable conversations when development is needed. You know, if there is a character or a chemistry or competence issue. But the motivation is always to remove a blind spot in somebody, you know, in whoever you're responsible to, um, to remove that blind spot so they can grow as a leader. And so with the right motivation, it's easier to have some of those conversations, but they don't happen if you don't put great managers in those leadership roles. I was um, listening to Patrick Lanchoni's podcast the other day, Tony, and he was talking mm-hmm. about performance management and that always kind of piques my mind. And he said, uh, he used this word picture, hopefully I'm remembering it well. He said, picture yourself just about to start running a marathon. And then someone from the crowd gets out of their chair and they run up to you and they say, I'm going to run this marathon. What do I need to do to be successful? And of course the marathoner (laughs) says, start training nine months ago. And he used that word picture um, because he gets asked so often. And I do too. Sometimes it's like, this guy's got to go. What do I need to do? And the answer is, well, that should have started nine months ago, those conversations. Mm -hmm. So that would be my one, my one final thought for today. Well, uh, Amy, I'm looking forward to answering some of these questions that have come in. But before I do that, let me just remind you, we want you to commit today to start the process of restructuring your church staff for the health and effectiveness of your ministry. We want you to accomplish a great mission as a church. And because of that, we're serious. We want you to put this on your calendar and decide when will we kick off this process to restructure our staff team. And for some of you smaller churches, it's not just staff leadership that we need to look at. It's also how do we restructure the other ministries, the volunteers, the lay leadership teams too, that are supporting our mission. Uh, And it's just too important to the health of our churches to to delay uh, and not do this. So we hope you'll put it on your calendar and actually make it happen. 